What's up, my friend? Abby here, and welcome back to Ask Abby, where I answer your writing questions and help you make your story matter. So a lot of you probably noticed that we hit 50,000 people in this community. What? I was freaking out so excited when I saw that, and I just wanna thank you so much for being here. I am so proud of all of you for what you are doing with your books and your screenplays and your graphic novels and your short stories and just all of your writing projects. <sighs> You're amazing. Keep going. Let's keep going together. Let's keep growing this community, shall we? And yeah, just thank you. Thank you so much for 50K. Also, I'm introducing a new way for you to ask me questions for the Ask Abby show. So I saw a lot of you guys saying that you wanted to participate in the Ask Abby show by asking me questions that I answer here on YouTube but you don't have Facebook or you don't like Facebook. So posting in the Facebook group wasn't really an option for you. So I created another option. You can now submit your questions for the Ask Abby show right here on YouTube. Below this video, you'll see a join button. And when you click it, you'll be able to get into the secret members only area of my channel where you can post your story questions for the Ask Abby videos, as well as hang out with other awesome members and talk about story. Remember, I'm still going to randomly choose three to four questions each time I do a video. There is also an option to get early access to my videos. So if you join at that level, you get into the members only area to ask questions for the Ask Abby show, and you also get to see my videos the day before everyone else gets to see them. So, that's pretty lit. You can still post your Ask Abby questions in the Facebook group if you're already a part of the Facebook group, part of the Patreon. Don't worry, nothing has changed over there. I just wanted to give this as an option too for people who don't have Facebook. I still wanna answer your questions and I don't want you to feel left out. So think of it like this. All of the cool bonus stuff is still happening over on Patreon, but that's where we go beyond videos, okay? So templates, VIP podcast, Facebook group, all that. And if you join here on YouTube, you can submit your questions for Ask Abby without having to go on Facebook. And you can also get early access to my videos before anyone else sees them, if that's your thing. Okay, I think everyone gets it, Abby, stop talking. <laughs> Let's answer some questions. First question is from Kimberly. Do you have any tips for seamlessly handling multiple timelines in a novel? Are there ways to do it without simply having a new chapter slash heading for the time shift or italics to identify a literal PTSD flashback? Is there a way to have a character recollect an event to another character without it being a big monologue? My work in progress spans three generations of characters discovering events that happened 200 years prior and I'm struggling with how to juggle everything. Thanks. That's a good question and I love flashbacks. It's like one of my favorite topics to talk about. <laughs> so first and foremost, I would say that it depends on the style of your story. Cause style with flashbacks is like everything. And, and it's really cool because you can bring your own style to it and make it something really unique and fun. But if you're doing major time jumps across the span of 200 years, and you're gonna be doing a lot of them, then you want to make it super clear to your reader. You want it to be super clear and super obvious where they are in the history of the world, <laughs> okay? With a story like this, it's very easy to be jumping all over the place and then the reader is confused. They don't know what the heck is going on and a confused mind always says no. So you gotta be careful of that. The most important thing to remember, of course, is cause and effect, okay? What triggers the flashback? That's the cause of the flashback and what is the lasting effect it has on how we see the story going forward. I recently wrote a flashback scene, a sequence in my current work in progress that is exactly what you're saying with the italics, but it was like interspersed with a scene happening in the present. So it would like cut back and forth. So it was like intercutting to this flashback scene that happened in the same location with different characters, different characters were present. And because it was flashing back and forth, italics, non-italics, italics, non-italics, you knew that it was a flashback, because the character that was in the flashback was not in the present moment. That is just one of those stylistic things that I wanted my reader to see this scene unfolding as if they were watching a movie. So <laughs> you can almost do these things. You can do like these stylistic editing things that make the reader see it like a film. Just sit down and ask yourself, 
how would I write this if I was writing it like a screenplay or like a script or I was trying to explain it to somebody so that they could make a visual of it? Because you're really trying to give your reader a visual in that case. In the case of something that's very stylistic and you're cutting back and forth to show how these two locations had two different things going on 200 years apart from each other, that can be really cool. So look into different ways to do that. Ask yourself, what ways can I pull this off? And try different methods, try different things. I would also highly recommend watching the podcast that me and my sister did about writing a non-linear timeline in a story. So that has to do with flashbacks, but also has to do with like, I think exactly what you're talking about, non-linear timeline. So that had tons of great story examples and we, we talk the heck out of it. <laughs> so check it out, it's one of my favorite podcasts. Okay, next question is from Georgina. Ask Abby or anyone else who can help. Synopsis, I have to write a synopsis of 300 words or less. I have no idea where to start and I need to have it done by the end of the month for a manuscript assessment I have booked through my State Writers Center. Any tips, advice, what do I need to include? What can be left out? I have no idea where to start. 300 words doesn't seem like much. Start with what matters, which is the internal conflict of your main character. By internal conflict, I'm talking about their desire clashing with their fear. So this is the kind of thing that we talk about in the character profile, okay? My character profile, when you break down what is your character's goal, what do they want, what's their conflicting fear that's holding them back, what's the misbelief, that is really your hook. Your hook might also include your premise, but it can't just be about what happens. That's where everybody goes wrong. They think that an intriguing story is just something crazy or ironic happens. That's not it. That might be a good place to start, but you have to take it deeper than that. You have to take it to the character's beliefs, what's happening inside of them. Okay, so that's your hook paragraph. That's gonna be short, it's gonna be about 50 words. An easy way to do this to get to 300 words would be to break it down to three paragraphs. Each paragraph is an act of your book, okay? So if you're following the three-act story structure, each paragraph would be 80 words, pretty much, like 80 words long, so 80, 80, 80, and then a 50-word hook. So the 50-word hook would be your character's desire for clashing with their fear, get into their internal conflict, preferably in 50 words or less, and then describe each act of your novel in 80 words or less, okay? And that, that leads you to 290 words total. You don't have to include every detail of what happens. Stick to the main plot, only name two or three characters. By name, I mean give them, like say their actual names. Um, other characters you can mention as like, you know, an enemy or their ex-girlfriend or their parents, just name them like that. Don't name them with their actual names because you don't wanna to have too many names in your synopsis. Two names is like ideal. Breaking it down into three paragraphs plus a 50 word hook, three 80 word paragraphs. Each paragraph is act one, act two, act three, okay? That's gonna help you a lot. My book blurb masterclass, which is coming soon, I'm still working on it. That's gonna be really, really helpful for this and also for writing book blurbs, obviously, but it also works for summaries. So stick around for that. <laughs> okay, next question is from Prince. All right, so today I'm spending my birthday writing since it's one of the few days I can get people to do what I want, i.e. shut up and leave me alone so I can write. And in doing so, I ran it into a couple of questions I'd like to ask Abby. One, I'm writing the second draft of my first book and I kind of feel like I'm overcompensating, like where I unnecessarily wrote too much in the original, I feel myself paraphrasing or cutting too much in this draft. Do you ever find yourself doing that? What do you do to deal with it? This could just be my writer's paranoia telling me it's not good enough, but I don't know. Okay, I'm going to um, stop and answer that one first. So I guess I would ask, are you aiming for a specific word count? Because if you're not, then it can be as long as you want. <laughs> like, don't feel like you have to cut words just for the sake of cutting words or just for the sake of making it shorter or even making it the same length as a book in a similar genre. Sometimes it's better to have a book with a longer word count with more subplots, depends on the genre you're writing obviously, but it might fit the genre and it might be better for it to be more words than to be less. But as far as like actually making developmental changes and edits and stuff, I, I talk about all of that in my how to revise a novel video, which I would highly recommend. I think will help you a lot in this. It's also really helpful to get feedback from a trusted beta reader. So even if you're not in the final stages of being ready for an editor or anything like that, just getting developmental feedback from a beta reader and being able to ask them like, is the opening too slow? Is the, does the middle act drag on too long? Is this subplot 
engaging or does it do you care about it um the questions like that can really give you a lot of insight as to what you should actually be revising and spending time on because you might be like spending a lot of time on trying to edit this one piece or one um, aspect of your book and the reader actually doesn't have a problem with it. They just fly through it. They love that part and it's not problematic, but there may be some other issues somewhere else that a objective eye can see better. Now, if you find that you're cutting out a ton of detail from say a subplot, because you're trying to make the word count shorter, you're trying to make it like a quicker read, but now you feel like the subplot sucks because it's so butchered, maybe consider taking the subplot out entirely. Like save it somewhere because you might use it for another story or you might even make it a story in and of itself. But maybe there's just too much going on. Maybe there's too many subplots. Maybe there's too much stuff happening that you need to narrow it down. Okay, second part of your question. My MC and his love interest already kind of know that they like each other but aren't slash can't be together because of various circumstances and other stuff, including need for personal growth throughout the series. So my question is how long is it reasonable to keep up with the, I'm sorry, keep up the will they or won't they of being in a relationship together before it becomes too drawn out. Slow burn romance is so good. I love it. Most readers love it. Just don't let it stagnate for too long. That's when it starts to feel dragged out. I've seen this over and over again in so many different things. I find that when relationships start to feel drawn out is when the progress kind of just stops. Like these characters just keep rehashing the same issues over and over again and it feels boring because it is. <laughs> because nothing is changing. If you can keep things changing all the time, even little tiny steps forward, it will keep your slow burn romance burning. I like to ask myself this question at the end of each chapter I outline. What has changed? Even if it's something really simple, really small, like character A tells character B something that they didn't know before. Something should change with every scene. That's what keeps the plot moving forward. Okay, so I hope that helps. I hope that answers your questions. Happy birthday, by the way. Hopefully no one interrupts you while you're writing. That would be the best birthday present ever, right? Okay, next question is from Emily. Hi, I have a question for everyone and Ask Abby. How do I bring all my ideas for both my stories into solid plots? I've been working on my long outlines and have strong ideas for both in terms of what is going to happen, but I can't seem to bring them all together. I have this problem like <laughs> more often than I can even say. Like, I will have tons of ideas for one story, particularly like whatever I'm working on at the time, I'll have like all these ideas, all these scene, all these scenes just like come to my mind and I'm like, I wanna write all of them, but where do they go? Like that's honestly the thing that I probably spend the most time figuring out as far as in the outlining process is like, I have this brain dump of all this stuff that I want to write into this story, but where does it go? What order does it go in? So what I do with that is, I create like a very simple bullet point list of all the stuff I want to happen. All the stuff that needs to happen, I should say. It's going to be an elimination process, obviously. Once you list everything out, once you start listing all this stuff out, you will look at what is the cause and effect of each thing, okay? How does one thing lead to another? That's how I figure out what order they should go in. So there's going to be a very obvious outline with the story structure, <laughs> if you know me, you know that I use the three act story structure. And so it's gonna be pretty obvious, like that's more of an inciting incident type thing that's gonna happen in the disaster plot point. Some of these things will jump out at you as you look at them. But you have to ask yourself, how does one thing lead to another? Because everything has to have a cause and effect. Okay, that's how real life works. That's how our brain processes information. If something is randomly just inserted in the middle of your story for no reason, like there's this scene where we all go somewhere and do absolutely nothing for no reason, the reader is gonna be like, what's the significance of this? Because everything so far has had a significance except for this, I'm confused. And sadly, some scenes will have to go. When you start listing them out and you start looking at what's the cause and effect, why do these scenes matter? What changes the story because of these scenes? How do these scenes change the story? How do they move the plot forward? Once you start looking at them, you might see a few that don't move the plot forward, that don't matter. You don't have to like never write those scenes, but just keep in mind the fact that they are not necessary. 
But if you're really adamant about having a particular scene that you really wanted to write, ask yourself what else you could pair it with. So take an important scene and then take maybe your less important scene or your unimportant scene and see how you can maybe merge those two things so that both things can happen. You can still have the thing that you wanted to write, but you also paired it with something important. You made something important happen in the same scene. So the scene now becomes important. But the thing is sometimes we just have too much stuff that we want to write. We have too many ideas and they don't all fit in one story and that's okay. Save your ideas, definitely save them. Don't delete them forever. Save them somewhere. You might use them later for a different story or for this story if you find another way to incorporate it later. But this is something that I think a lot of, especially beginner writers do, beginner screenwriters as well. They try to put too much stuff into one piece and get a little bit too distracted on all these different topics and all these different subplots. And they want to create this huge, all-encompassing story about all these different things. But in doing so, you kind of lose the focus of what the point was. What was the big idea? What was the main story truth? And that can do more harm than good. Some writers can naturally pull off a really complex story right out of the gate, but I would recommend starting small. Start with one character and what that one character is going to learn and go on a journey and realize what is the truth that they're going to realize as a result of their journey? How are they going to transform? What is the idea that you want to bring to this story? What's the big idea? Stay focused on that and you won't go wrong. Okay guys, awesome questions as always. Hopefully you got something good out of my replies. If you would like your question answered here on YouTube, hit the join button below this video or go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons. You can submit questions both ways, choose whichever one works best for you. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos and publishing videos every single Wednesday and I would love to have you here in the community. Until next week, my friend, rock on. Shh. My work in progress spans three generations of characters discovering, discovering something if I could turn my page. Synopsises, synopsises, Abby? I think it's synopses, isn't it? Synopses. I'm just gonna say summaries instead. <laughs>